where metaphysics is concerned, all it can alter with time and place is, on the one hand, the manner of expression, that is to say the more or less external forms which metaphysics can assume and which may be varied indefinitely, and on the other hand, the degree of knowledge or ignorance of it to be found among men, but metaphysics in itself always remains fundamentally and unalterably the same, for its object is one in its essence, or to be more exact, without duality, as the Hindus put it, and that object, again by the very fact that it lies beyond nature, is also beyond all change. The Arabs express this by saying that the doctrine of oneness is one. Knowledge belonging to the universal order of necessity lies beyond all the distinctions that condition the knowledge of individual things, of which that between subject and object is a general and basic type. This also goes to show that the object of metaphysics is in no wise comparable with the particular object of any other kind of knowledge whatsoever, and indeed it can only be referred to as an object purely by analogy, because, in order to speak of it at all, one is forced to attach to it some denomination or other. Likewise, when one speaks of the means of attaining metaphysical knowledge, it is evident that such means can only be one and the same thing as knowledge itself, in which subject and object are essentially unified. This amounts to saying that the means in question, if indeed it is permissible to describe it by that word, cannot in any way resemble the exercise of a discursive faculty such as individual human reason. As we have said before, we are dealing with the supra-individual and consequently with the supra-rational order, which does not in any way mean the irrational. Metaphysics cannot contradict reason, but it stands above reason, which has no bearing here except as a secondary means for the formulation and external expression of truths that lie beyond its province and outside its scope. Metaphysical truths can only be conceived by the use of a faculty that does not belong to the individual order, and that by reason of the immediate character of its operation may be called intuitive, but only on the strict condition that it is not regarded as having anything in common with the faculty which certain contemporary philosophers call intuition, a purely instinctive and vital faculty that is really beneath reason and not above it. To be more precise, it should be said that the faculty we are now referring to is intellectual intuition, the reality of which has been consistently denied by modern philosophy, which has failed to grasp its real nature whenever it has not preferred simply to ignore it. This faculty can also be called the pure intellect, following the practice of Aristotle and his scholastic successors, for to them the intellect was in fact that faculty which possessed a direct knowledge of principles. Aristotle expressly declares that the intellect is truer than science, which amounts to saying that it is more true than the reason which constructs that science. He also says that nothing is more true than the intellect, for it is necessarily infallible from the fact that its operation is immediate, and because, not being really distinct from its object, it is identified with the truth itself. A natural phenomenon, like anything else belonging to the sensible order, can be taken to symbolize an idea or a principle and a symbol has no use or justification, except in virtue of the fact that it belongs to an order inferior to the thing symbolized. Similarly, there is doubtless a general and natural tendency in man to employ the human form for symbolical purposes, but the practice, which in itself is not open to objection any more than the use of a geometrical figure or any other method of representation, in no wise constitutes anthropomorphism, so long as man does not become a dupe of the figuration he has adopted. Religion, however, has always tried to react against the anthropomorphic tendency and to combat it in principle, even when a more or less garbled conception of religion in the popular mind sometimes helped to develop it in practice. The peoples called Semitic, such as the Jews and Arabs, are in this respect akin to the Western peoples. There is in fact no other reason to account for the prohibition of symbols under a human form which is common both to Judaism and Islam, but with the exception that in Islam it was never so strictly applied among the Persians, for whom the employment of symbols of this kind offered fewer dangers because, being more completely Eastern than the Arabs, and moreover of a quite different race, they were much less prone to slip into anthropomorphism. Errors of application are no doubt always possible, 
especially in periods when the light of tradition has grown dim. But they do not in any way affect the validity of the principle, and it can be said that to deny it implies theoretically, if not always in practice, the overturning of every legitimate hierarchy. At the same time, it can be seen how absurd is the attitude of those Europeans who feel indignant because a man cannot pass from his own caste into a higher one. In effect, this would imply nothing more nor less than a change of individual nature, or in other words, a man would have to cease being himself in order to become another man, which is obviously absurd. A being will remain throughout the whole of his individual existence what he is potentially at the time of his birth. The question why a being is himself and not another is a pointless one. The truth is that every being, each according to his own nature, is a necessary element in the total and universal harmony. These indications will suffice to explain the meaning of the symbolical description of the origin of castes, as it is to be found in numerous texts, notably in the Purusha Sukta of the Rig Veda, from which the following quotation is taken. Of Purusha, the Brahman was the mouth, the Kshatriya, the arms, the Vaishya, the thighs, the Shudra was born under his feet. Here we find the enumeration of the four castes, the differentiation of which constitutes the basis of the social order, and which are susceptible of more or less numerous secondary subdivisions. The Brahmins represent essentially the spiritual and intellectual authority, the Kshatriyas the administrative prerogative, comprising both the judicial and the military offices, of which the royal function is simply the highest degree. To the Vaishyas, belong the whole varied range of economic functions in the widest sense of the word, including the agricultural, industrial, commercial and financial functions. As for the Shudras, they carry out the tasks necessary to assure the purely material subsistence of the community. It should be added that the Brahmins are not priests in the western and religious sense of the word, no doubt their functions include the accomplishment of various kinds of rites because they must possess the knowledge necessary to make them fully effective, but they also include, above everything else, the conservation and regular transmission of the traditional doctrine. Indeed the function of teaching, represented by the mouth in the symbolism we have just mentioned, was regarded by nearly all ancient peoples as the highest priestly function, because their civilizations were based in their entirety upon a doctrinal principle. For the same reason, deviations from the doctrine were generally bound up with a subversion of the social hierarchy, as can be seen, for example, in the repeated attempts made by the Kshatriyas to throw off the overlordship of the Brahmins, an overlordship, the justification of which will be apparent from all that has been said concerning the real nature of Hindu civilization.